my perspective, because there's so many things under that AI security umbrella, I think the interesting question I like to ask is what is new? What is the new thing that people should be worried about? And I think the new thing is that data has now become cold. Every few months you have a new model that completely changes the name of the game. And so for us it's very important also to design a product that can integrate with the companies that are really at the bleeding edge of deploying AI systems and also learn from them. So we want to be with the people defining the future so we can also shape our product in a way that adapts as that future gets it's defined. Hi everybody, welcome to the Deveco Breakfast Bar. Here we speak with different people involved in the business landscape, share their expertise, delve into the latest tech trends and explore the ins and outs of IT outsourcing. I'm Oleg Sarikov and today I'm excited to have Matteo Roes, co-founder at Lakira. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss new episodes. Hi Matteo and thanks for joining me today. Hey Oleg, thank you for the invitation, great to be here. Let's start our podcast with a little blitz. I start a sentence and you continue. That's good. Entrepreneurship gave me... A lot of freedom. Entrepreneurship deprived me... A lot of flexibility. My main superpower is... My team. My main weakness is... Lack of time. When I'm afraid, I... Reach for help in people I trust. You have had quite a unique career path from engineering in Paris to roles at Google, Facebook, and now co-founding Lakira. Can you take us back to the moment you first realized you wanted to work in tech and AI and co-found Lakira? The story goes way back. In university, I was really into maths and probability theory, so I really thought I wanted to work in finance. And I actually ended up joining a bank where I worked on as a quant. And then very quickly realized that there was so much happening on the technology side of things. This was 2013, where Google acquired DeepMind and so many cool things were happening on the AI side. I realized I wanted to be part of that. And so ended up going into an ML PhD and ultimately contributing to that. And I basically saw the whole field of AI evolve over 10 years and eventually joined Google, where I just realized there was such a gap in the maturity at which we bring traditional software to the world to billions of people and how we brought AI into the world. It was very, very difficult for people to bring even one model to the world, say autonomous driving or medical imaging, let alone scale that. It became clear that there was a unique opportunity to contribute to building that foundation. And that's when we decided to start LaCare. You have had a team said Google, Facebook and Credit Suisse before co-founding LaCira. What were the most formative lessons you took from these vastly different environments? I think, as I mentioned, Credit Suisse was really not the place for me, so I ended up leaving quite quickly. But what I did have there were amazing mentors that were very inspirational for me going forward. I think at Meta, I was there doing my PhD and that was a very, in hindsight, a very powerful time. I was there in, in the research lab in Paris and it was a small team, but in that team you had the people that are now the founders of Mistral, the founders of QTI, and you know a lot of very important, significant players in the European AI market. And Meta really gave me like a glimpse at the future and what people are building and where things are going. And that really played a big role in shaping my intentions going forward and my career. And finally, Google, I think, was probably one of the most significant where I went from being a researcher in machine learning to being a software engineer in a product that serves billions of people. And I think I just got to see, the, again, the massive gap between how we develop AI and how we develop traditional software. And it became very clear that bringing that level of rigor and that level of reliability to how we develop AI was a core mission if we wanted to bring AI to the world safely and securely. And so that was a key part of the core motivation behind starting LaCare ultimately. You have briefly asked this question, but I would like to understand a little bit more. How did your time as one and your PhD research influence your transition into the AI security space? Yeah, great question. I think the time as a quant really was more of a foundation. I think it's a space that requires strong foundations in math and computer science, and that really played a big role in what I did afterwards. My PhD was ultimately centered around the topic called transfer learning. So if you want to think about it, transfer learning is all about how do you build AI systems when the distribution of the data I was trained on changes very drastically. So imagine you train an autonomous car in London and suddenly, I don't know, you change the city or suddenly it's 
raining very significantly and you never saw that during training, you know, how do you ultimately build AI systems that can handle this kind of real world shift? And as you can imagine, the ideas that underline such work are really all about bringing systems to the world, making them work in the real world. And already there, I realized there was a massive gap between the theory and the practice and that we needed to do a lot of work to achieve that shipping at scale. As a co-founder and a chief science officer, how do you balance building product vision with tackling real-world AI security challenges? Yeah, I think that's a very good question and one that has been on my mind quite a lot through the last years. I think it's important to get the balance right. Ultimately, you want to build a generational company a company that really changes something significant. And for that, you need a view of the future. For us, that means a very clear understanding of how we see the world of the Internet of Agents and a world where AI agents are powering a big part of our economy. And just what layers does the infrastructure to support that needs for it to actually happen in the real world and exist? And we've spent a lot of time thinking through that over the years. And I think that has really shaped a vision of the steps required to get us there. And we let that really permeate the whole way we think about about the company, we talk about the company and we build products. But of course, that needs to be matched with something today as we build the product. And so ultimately, what's important there is to keep that vision in mind, but also build a product for today, for the needs today. Ultimately, we have people facing real challenges, building systems and deploying them in production. And so you want to empower them to ship reliably. And the last thing is we work in a very, very fast moving field. Every few months, you have a new model that completely changes the name of the game. And so for us, it's very important also to design a product that can integrate with the companies that are really at the bleeding edge of deploying AI systems and also learn from them. So we want to be with the people defining the future so we can also shape our product in a way that adapts as that future gets defined. Gendalf, the Curious Educational Platform, has reached over a million users, to be honest, impressive results. What was the motivation behind creating this resource and what impact has it had on the broader understanding of AI security? Yeah, Gandalf is really something very, very special. I mean, at the end, we built Gandalf during a hackathon at La Quera in our own effort to understand AI security better and how these systems break. And after being very happy users ourselves and getting addicted ourselves to the magic of Gandalf, we decided that this is something we could share with the world. And the tool did its own work, right? It then went viral and people love it. And as you say, we have over a million players. We have over 60 million attacks collected. And the first thing that is amazing is just to see the community that has been built behind this is really something very special. You can go on YouTube and find people recording themselves and playing Gandalf for hours, but also it has really given us a distillation of all the world's creativity. Essentially, people from all over the world, from all languages and backgrounds have played Gandalf and really done their best to break the system. And so we ultimately have been able to learn from that, like a general map of all the ways in which people try to break the systems. And those learnings have really made it into the way we build our products. And that's really, really important. And some of that work has recently made it into even academic research. So we just got a paper accepted to ICML, for example, that looks at that data to make claims about what it teaches us for real world security and real world systems, which includes insights on how to choose your defenses and how to design your system to ultimately be not only secure, but also to be useful to people. As you can imagine, Oleg, like if you block every single user request, you have a very secure system, but not very usable. And so Gandalf helps us make a lot of statements in that direction. Yeah, definitely. No bugs, no code. From your perspective, how can companies integrate security into AI development without shifting innovation? I think the way I like to think about security is really as an enabler. If you think back as an analogy, I like to think of the history of railroads, say in the US or something, where originally that there's actually very dangerous. There were a lot of accidents and deaths because of trains that couldn't really function in a safe and secure way. And when the safety and security technology started to develop around that, like brakes and signaling in the rails and this and that, that was an enabler for the industry to proliferate ultimately. And so as a company today trying to innovate in AI, if you don't have the right security, you're actually unable to innovate even because you're in a very vulnerable position and you're unable to understand the risks you're under and how people can attack you. And so I'll say by choosing the right security partner is not a stifler for innovation, it's really like an enabler ultimately to be successful. 
What are some of the biggest and most pressing security challenges that companies deploying Gen AI applications are currently facing? There are so many. I think it's a completely new beast and it redefines every single aspect of security. You have some questions, for example, like shadow AI. Who in the company is using AI without us knowing? Just something like that, that discoverability side of things is very important to companies and something they really care about. I think from my perspective, because there's so many things under that AI security umbrella. I think the interesting question I like to ask is what is new? What is the new thing that people should be worried about? And I think the new thing is that data has now become code. And what does that mean? It means that these LLMs are consuming instructions from users, are consuming documents, are consuming data from the web and are acting on that, are actually writing software, doing actions based on that data. And that's something we really don't know how to handle that. That complexity is in a way what makes them so powerful. You can go and give random instructions and it just does this very complex thing. But at the same time, it means that attackers can, in the right way, leave instructions lying around that will modify the behavior of your system and will ultimately allow them to exploit it. And so I think the reason that's so challenging for companies is that, first of all, we don't have that mentality yet. A spreadsheet, for example, can manipulate your system. That's something that people are, don't really think about too much. But second, because that really becomes, for the first time in cybersecurity, like a really AI first problem. So if you think about the way these attacks are being delivered, they're delivered in text, in images. You can't imagine how many variations people can come up with to write the same thing with mistakes in spelling, with spacings. In Gandalf, an example I talk a lot about recently because I really like it is people write Morse code to hack the LLM and the LLM understands that. And so you need a security layer that is able to understand all of those intricacies and complexities of language. That's ultimately the real challenge challenge is that only AI as a technique and methodology can even try to address that magnitude of a challenge. And so I think one of the biggest challenges for the industry as a whole is that the company that will succeed at protecting companies from these new challenges is one that will be really built with AI at the core. It will not be like a traditional security company. It will really be an AI company working in security. What excites you most about the potential of AI in your industry? My industry in some sense is AI security. And as I just mentioned, it's all AI in some sense. We really need AI to build it. And so to me, that is very exciting in many ways. It really means that you get to be at the bleeding edge of the technology. Some of the stuff we have to build at Lacera is really pushing the boundary of what LLMs can do and what AI models can do. That's just very exciting to be in a field where you get to play with the shiniest toys and do the most amazing work while at the same time creating value and protection for the most advanced companies in the world. Lakira has offices in San Francisco and Zurich. What are some strategies for building a united team with members from various time zones and cultures? It's a good question. I think it, probably there are books written about this and a million blog posts is a really hard thing, but also one that is very powerful and that brings a lot of synergies and value into the team. There are a few things that I would mention. One is you have to be very intentful about the overlap you have as a team. It's nine hours difference with San Francisco, right? So you have a few core hours where you can do work together and it's very important to organize the company cadence in a way that maximizes what can be done with those hours. It's very important to get good at async work and async communication as well, so that you really get to not be blocked or lose things in improper communication. Also, it has been very useful for us to have a more slightly different functions within the different locations. So really most of our technical talent is in Zurich. Engineers and researchers are mostly based in Zurich and can operate autonomously in some sense within that. And then we have amazing functions in SF like sales and product and marketing where they are really world class. And then of course there is overlap between and we work together as a company, but it's important to have kind of units that can be quite autonomous within each location so that you're not constantly blocking one another. Are there specific regions or countries that you find particularly promising for tech talent, except Zurich probably? I mean, Zurich is great for sure. Google has the biggest office outside of the US here. You have OpenAI just moved here, Anthropic just moved here. I think all of this shows there's an understanding that it's just, just an amazing place in Europe to hire tech talent. We have worked with remote people like all over Europe as well as and in the story of La Quera, and there are just amazing places everywhere. Even places like Paris has become really good given the recent AI developments there. So hard to pinpoint a unique place. I think there are different places with very strong talent and I think each has advantages in different ways. It's kind of a no-brainer to ultimately try to build potentially teams that leverage all of that richness. The challenge is more on the integration side, as we discussed earlier. How do you make that remote team work well with one another? What are your thoughts on advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing? 
We actually outsource some of the work ourselves as well on the engineering side. I definitely see great advantages, of course. You can leverage amazing teams that are also ready to go and very good at their own topic. And I think that's been very powerful and has enabled us to move very quickly on some things and to actually get to execute quite fast. And also access. We work with great partners that allow us to get access to those resources very fast. So we don't need to hire and go through the painful, more costly process of hiring full-time employees. We can outsource some of that very quickly. Of course, the challenges come generally around integration into the team and how to make sure that you have cohesive teams that form between contractors and full-time employees and that you give enough context to contractors to ultimately have autonomy and do great work and take initiative. I think that is sometimes a little bit difficult, but when it works well, it can do amazing things. And I think it definitely does amazing things for us. How do you see the role of IT outsourcing evolving in the tech industry, especially with advancements in automation and AI? ultimately will probably help companies move very quickly, especially if you think about earlier stage startups and so on. The possibility to build something from scratch will really increase and the know-how to get going will become very specialized, at least on the AI side. And so you can actually imagine a world where outsourcing early on can help you move very quickly and bring your ideas to life. Obviously, the skills that are brought to the outsourcing world will need to shift and kind of go in the direction of helping bring AI products to life and the full life cycle around that. What is it exactly? What do you need? There's stuff on the data side, stuff on the serving side, you know, and so making sure the outsourcing provides comprehensive offerings in that direction seems important to me. As we wrap up our conversation, what advice would you give to companies considering IT outsourcing but concerned about losing control over their technology? I think to me, the biggest thing is around what I mentioned earlier. Ultimately, it can work really, really well. But I think the employees that you are outsourcing need to be managed very carefully and need to be integrated in the team really well. It's not something that is just going to work by itself. You're integrating people into the team and you should almost treat it as if they were full-time employees and integrate them in a way that gives them autonomy and empowerment within the team. If that is done correctly, it, it can work really, really well. Again, I think what does, typically doesn't work is if you just expect to hire six front-end engineers and then you hope that it all works perfectly without any context and they do the great work and ultimately you do need to integrate them in a way that enables them to be successful. Mateo, thanks for your time. Thanks for an interesting conversation. I really appreciate you joining me today and spending time with me on this podcast. I'm sure that my auditory will find it very interesting. Thanks so much, Alec. That was a great conversation. Thank you for inviting me. If you enjoy our discussion and want to stay updated on the future episodes, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. That way you will not miss out on the latest insights and conversations from the Delico Breakfast Bar. See you in the next episode.